come not to praise winsomeness, but to bury it. Welcome to The Antithesis. My name is Owen Strand, and I will be your host. The evangelical movement has focused a lot in the last 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, on winsomeness. The idea here is basically this. Christians used to be known for being against culture, and today, thoughtful, respectable Christians should be known for being gracious, reasonable citizens who can talk with others, uh, be thought well of by others, and conduct themselves nicely in polite society. The evangelical movement, as I say, has made winsomeness really the cardinal virtue of the Christian Church. The term winsome is not going to be found in Scripture. It's not found in the New Testament. There's different matters that one can draw on to argue in a roundabout way for a case for winsomeness. But fundamentally, we need to know at the outset, as we discuss winsome culture here on this episode, that you're not going to find chapter and verse on this matter. Winsomeness is a virtue that has been elevated in recent years by the likes of Tim Keller, Russell Moore, David French, Ed Stetzer, and others of that ilk. Many who would, in other words, argue that Christianity needs to be known by what it is for rather than what it is against. Many who would say, yes, we may have biblical convictions on contested matters, but we're not going to lead out with those. We're not going to make a big deal of those. In fact, we're actively going to not set those aside, but we're definitely not going to focus on those matters. We're instead going to talk to you about matters of common agreement, and then we're going to try to show you the wonder and beauty and uh, profundity of Christianity. And a, a number of figures in this movement would also try, in political terms, to say Christianity is not political. We're not like those old fundamentalists. We're not the moral majority. We have come with a new strategy and a new approach. We're not even really trying to win in the public square at all. We're, we're even willing and perhaps, in some cases, happy to lose because we recognize that if we get too entwined with politics, then we end up losing our witness. These are the kind of ideas that have proliferated in the age of winsomeness, and a kind of neither left nor right Christianity, not just on political issues, but in general, a, a, a third-way approach that charts a course between extreme fundamentalism and extreme leftism that leaves Christians in the reasonable center. Christians don't, therefore, according to a figure like a James Davison Hunter, make too much noise or ruckus in the public square or in a society, a culture. Instead, Christians focus, as we talked about in our previous episode of The Antithesis, on being a faithful presence, being a, a gracious element of a corporation, of a university, uh, of uh, an entertainment monolith, something like this. The evangelical movement in a, in a less highbrow sense, has focused a lot of attention on being wi winsome. And a lot of churches and church plants have been structured along these lines. We're not going to be like your grandfather's church, so to speak. We're instead going to focus on all the points of common contact we have with a secular world, and we're going to try to be known in our community for being a very positive presence. We, we don't want to be known uh, by what we're against, to reference that phrase once more. The Winsomeness Project, then, has had about 10 to 20 years to play out, and as we talked about, it is very ill-fitted for what is called the negative world. I'm using that term from Aaron Wren, who's built off of Charles Taylor's categories, along, among with other thinkers. We're in the negative world. We're being a Christian, at least in a lot of places in America and the West, gets you a, a black check mark by your name. It does not get you uh, cool kid points. It gets you demerits in broader society and culture. So winsomeness is not fitted for the negative world. And in reality, as a second matter of analysis here on this episode, the whole branding exercise has crashed and burned. The winsome project has played out, and it's frankly played out badly. It did so because of three major areas uh, that have emerged and arisen in American public life in the last five to seven years. The first area that really brought uh, out the division among Christians was Donald Trump. 
Donald Trump meant that if you were going to stand for a more conservative candidate, you were basically going to have to be saddled, at least the media would saddle you, with all the baggage of Donald Trump. Now, just to put this on record, a ton of evangelicals who supported Trump in 2016 and 2020 did not wish to back all of what Trump said, did, tweeted, and so on. In reality, the predominant case among conservative evangelicals for Donald Trump was, and has always been, that we approach politics not out of a sense that we're going to get the Messiah we like politically in every election, but we approach politics from the standpoint of what is sometimes called the lesser of two evils, not the most polite term, but there it is. So we're not trying to pick a perfect candidate. We're trying to pick the best candidate we can, to put that more positively. That was the predominant mindset of most conservative evangelicals, certainly all the ones I know, who voted for Trump. Now, there was a lot of debate in 2016 in particular over Trump, and I participated in that in a very small way and uh, had some criticism for Trump and am thankful that my criticism was over overcome and the criticism of others and that Trump was able to do a good bit of good in office, uh, good that still plays out into the current day. Not a perfect president, uh, a lot that uh, we can debate, a lot that we can talk through, some that Christians definitely would disagree with, and yet Donald Trump got a lot of good done in his presidency. But this divided evangelicals because if you supported Trump, the media presented you, in particular as an evangelical, as an uncritical, unthoughtful backer of everything Trump stood for and said. And so that really broke a lot of confessing conservative evangelicals. They hit a headwater they had never come to. We did not see such a quandary arise with the presidency of George W. Bush, for example, or other candidates after him. But with Trump, this polarizing figure, many evangelicals came to see that if they supported him, they would be seen as uh, uncritical backers of all elements of his public program. And that pushed many evangelicals into a choice. And some said, all right, I'm going to have to take the heat. I'm standing as best I can for biblical conservatism, as I call it. Uh, this isn't going to be fun. <laughs> I'm going to be maligned, and many were and still are, but I'm going to, to vote for the candidate who is at least closest to my understanding of scriptural priorities. And then others said, I am not taking this heat. I do not stand for what this man stands for. And furthermore, I'm going to be tagged for the rest of my life uh, along these lines, and I'm not willing to pay that price. So Trump was an early divider in the Christian movement, and suffice it to say, a fair number of evangelicals desired to be seen as winsome, and so did everything they could, among other reasons, to distance themselves from Trump. And to the current day, in mid-2022, some of the commentators I mentioned earlier including many others, cannot stop tweeting, speaking, and writing about Donald Trump. And I repeat myself, Donald Trump broke certain people. He really did. The, the spectacle of Trump, that is, is a spectacle that some public intellectuals who profess to be evangelical have never recovered from and may never recover from. We certainly pray they do. We pray that they come back to the scripture and to the solid rock of God's truth. Suffice it to say that if you wanted to be seen as winsome in the Trump era and following it, by the culture that is, by leftists, by elites, you're going to have to be against Trump. Absolutely, you have no option in the framing of the elite media to continue backing Trump but stay in the good graces of the secular elites. And it's important to note this. That is so much of what winsomeness as a cultural project is predicated upon, staying in the good graces of secular elites, being seen as a positive presence in society. And being a positive presence 
in the mindset of some, so as to hopefully make disciples in the Christian faith, if we're trying to understand the other side in the best possible light. A second major dividing element that has exposed the failure of the Winsome Project is lockdowns. The lockdowns divided not just America, but our world in a second massive, destabilizing, world-shaking way in the last few years. And if you were going to be seen as winsome, and remember that winsome is ultimately about, the winsome project that is ultimately about how others are seeing you, how they are receiving you, you are going to have to recognize that you would play a middle position at the very least on lockdowns and on COVID. COVID, as I've said numerous times, is a real virus and it had real effects in lots of different places. But COVID clearly was not anything close to what it was said to be. And it's very clear that many evil governments across the world used COVID, a real sickness, to accomplish tremendous authoritarian evil that continues to play out in the current day in places like Canada as just one example. Friends, continue to pray for our Canadian brothers and sisters. Pray for the Canadian church. Pray for the end of tyranny in Canada. The lockdowns divided the church again, because if your goal is to be seen as winsome by the secular world, and in particular by secular elite thought leaders and influencers— and power brokers, then you are not going to be able to take the position that the church must stay open in lockdown season. No, what you're going to emphasize is a hackneyed understanding of the second greatest commandment, that to love your neighbor, you actually should be locked down, not only be locked down, but be happily locked down, not only be happily locked down, but cheer on the lockdowns, which were being presented as health measures, when in reality they were the very opposite of health measures. The point is this. The lockdowns presented a second major test for the Winsome Project. And if you followed once more the trail of winsomeness defined by the good graces of cultural elites, you had no option to in any way promote in a strong sense, the gathered corporate worship of God's people, according to texts like Hebrews 10, 25. No, that puts you in the penalty box, standing for the priorities of God's Word, including the central priority of weekly gathered worship of the Church of Jesus Christ in local expression all over the world, made you a terrible individual according to many people who lit up my Twitter feed, for example, and I'm nobody, a murderer, one who was fomenting murder for encouraging Christians to gather together, for calling churches not to close. I'm on record about this. You can go back and listen if you want. Don't take my word for it here. Go back and listen. There was a ferocious storm that arose against anyone who would oppose lockdowns. And if you oppose lockdowns, just just to put this uh, very clearly here at the tail end of this little discussion, if you oppose lockdowns, you were bad, and you lost all your winsomeness points because the culture did not want the church to meet. (laughs) And so evangelicals who opposed the momentum of the culture lost their winsome brand. The third major movement that has divided the church and exploded the Winsome Project is wokeness. Because the Winsome Project is all about, repeating myself, staying in the good graces of unbelieving thought leaders, taking a stand against wokeness, critical race theory, and social justice, it was a tragically bad move. And so many evangelical preachers and teachers, at least those professing to be evangelical, took no stand against wokeness, are taking no stand against wokeness, and unless God does something great in their life, do not seem to be planning to take any stand, any clear one, 
sustained one, on wokeness. So this, this squares the circle. If you want to stay in the good favor of unbelievers, you are going to need to come to heel on the issue of wokeness. You are going to need to confess your white supremacy. Your church is going to need to read all the white books. Uh, from the pulpit, you're going to need to call for people to read the wretched book, White Fragility, by Robin D'Angelo. You're going to also commend, very likely, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Uh, you're probably going to encourage people to check out The Color of Compromise by Jamar Tisby. On and on it goes. You're, you're going, even if you're not fully embracing all the elements of the woke project, you're at least going to virtue signal that you're on the right side of history. In order to be seen as winsome, in order to be seen as a positive presence in a community, you cannot stand against this ideology. You have to affirm it in some way. You have to post a black square on Instagram in June 2020. If you do not do so, you will be seen as a negative presence. And that is what so many professing evangelicals fear, and I do mean fear, above all. The policy on all three of these massive cultural events was this. It was for winsome types to play the middle. Winsomeness, you see, is not really an attitude. It poses as that. That's what people say. It is, hey, guys, we need to be winsome. Well, who's going to argue against that? Who's a born-again believer? Again, winsome isn't a term you find in Scripture, but as we'll see in a minute, we are supposed to uh, walk in a godly way that stands apart from the world. We must. This is true. I'm saying it. But winsomeness is really about respectability. It's really about the opinion and esteem of the unbelieving elite in a given society. The unstated argument among Christians who champion winsomeness above all is basically this. The gospel advances best when Christians are seen as thoughtful, measured, kind, welcoming, and loving. That is when the church is going to make the most progression in a given place. That is when the gospel is going to break out. That is when we're going to be able to win unbelieving peers to Christ. When Christians, to repeat, are thoughtful, measured, kind, welcoming, and loving. But not just when Christians live that way. Please do not misunderstand this point. Do not miss this. This is crucial. When Christians are seen this way. Did you catch that? When the other side taps you as being this kind of Christian. When secularists say, you're not, in so many words, the bad kind of Christian, you're the good kind of Christian. And you actually get more credibility if they follow that by saying, you are conservative, doctrinally, or whatever, but you're the good kind of Christian. That is what the Winsomeness Project seeks above all. You're the good kind of Christian, even as you continue to seek to be biblical. And when, uh, an, when an unbeliever says that, winsome Christians then feel like they have won the, the lottery because they've been affirmed by the other side as being markedly Christian, distinctly Christian, conservative in their doctrine. You're still calling for me to repent and be a, become a Christian. And yet they stay in the good graces of unbelievers. They're seen as thoughtful, measured, kind, welcoming, and loving. That is what the Winsomeness Project wants. That's it. That's the goal. You want to stay a believer, at least you say you do, in terms of the doctrine you confess and even publicly proclaim. But then you also want, crucially, 
to stay in the positive esteem of the cultural gatekeepers around you. And what that means in addition is that you are going to be forced by virtue of having carefully cultivated this perch in a society to downplay your association with aggressive, bold, fearless, outspoken Christians. You're going to have to begrudgingly but heroically undermine such Christians. You're going to have to distance yourself from those Christians. In fact, you're going to have to spend most of your life's work helping the unbelieving world see that you're not that kind of Christian. That kind of Christian, the bold, fearless type that that speaks the truth without apology, that Christian is really your enemy. Your enemy is no longer Satan and those who do the work of Satan in the world of men. Your enemy, I don't mean that we're fighting flesh and blood, but I do mean you have to fight the forces of darkness wherever they are found. No, your enemy, if you are a winsome Christian, is fellow Christians. It's Christians who are bold and unapologetic and outspoken. Those are the ones who are causing you the trouble. You actually feel a ton of closeness, symbiosis with unbelievers, with respectable, thoughtful unbelievers. They are the ones you want to be around. They're the ones you tweet about. They're the ones who, when they praise you, you you highlight that to your followers on social media. Those are the ones you're after. They have what you want. You like them. You want to be around them. You want to go to their gatherings. You want to be profiled by them in their media outlets. You want their good graces. Uh, you, You want what they offer. They have what you want. And the bold, outspoken, conservative evangelicals, they cause you immense trouble because they won't shut up. They won't go away. And they ruin all your carefully cultivated reputation of winsomeness. They endanger that perch that you have so carefully crafted over long years, such that you have landed in the tractor beam of cultural respectability. And there are many today who are desperate to stay there, who profess to be a Christian, but who seem to value the world and its opinion still more highly than their fellow Christians, and even they are in danger of valuing the world's opinion more highly than God's opinion, than God's verdict. Christians, thirdly, must bear the fruit of the Spirit. Let's be very clear about this. I think some people on social media seem to understand, misunderstand, excuse me, the response that um, some of us are trying to call for against the negative world. They seem to read the framing negative world as if we, to whatever limited extent I'm being referenced here, are calling for a negative response to the negative world. They seem to think that if you say we've got to play hardball in the public square, you're calling for war. You're calling for Christians to hate flesh and blood. You're calling for Christians to abandon gentleness and kindness because that doesn't work. That is not remotely the proper biblical response to the negative world. Think of a text like Galatians 5, to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, Paul writes, is love, joy, peace, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, Paul writes, there is no law. So this is what Christians pursue every day of their life. This is what we pray to grow into. We want to bear this fruit. Just like you want, you are desperate for that tree in your backyard to bear actual fruit, 
I distinctly recall an apple tree on the Strand property growing up in Maine that uh, was cultivated for years, even decades, and only ever bore very nasty little crab apples. Well, that's not what we want to be, especially as God sanctifies us by his grace. We don't want to bear crab apples. We want to bear luscious, rich fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What wondrous traits these are when you find them in someone by God's working. This is always the plan. The plan is always to bear the fruit of the Spirit of Galatians 5. But we need to know that this bearing of fruit by the Spirit's power does not yield only one posture in the world God has made. Think of Jesus. Think of how Jesus says that he is gentle and lowly. Yet think of how Jesus is also the same Jesus who in John 2 scourges the temple, turns over tables, makes a whip of cords, and by implication in John 2, uses it. So you cannot reduce Jesus to just one mindset or one attitude or one approach in the world. In reality, uh, Jesus shows many different forms of approach to many different types of people. He can be absolutely searing with the religious leaders. He can call them dogs and vipers. He can turn over tables, basically uh, going ham in the temple in John 2. He can call little children to him and say that the kingdom, inheriting the kingdom, entails becoming like one of them. He can talk to a woman caught in sin with very strong conviction and yet also grace, real, rich, compassionate grace. Jesus ultimately dies for sinners, which shows his incredible humility and love and forgiveness. So Jesus does not only adopt what we could call one attitude or show one trait throughout his life. He shows many. And so too do you and I need to be like Jesus and be rightly incensed against the abuse of children and then be able to go and talk to the neighborhood child who's in a rough f- familial situation, they've done nothing to choose, and show kindness to them, and then talk to a family member who is taking us for granted, uh, who, who we need to call out in a loving and firm way, and then go into the public square and offer clear testimony to the sovereignty of Jesus Christ, and then go to the local church and encourage someone who has just lost their job and is in tremendously difficult straits. Do you understand the point? Being a Christian doesn't mean we only show one fruit all the time. There's a lot of different fruit we bear in myriad situations, and that's right, that's Christ-like, and in a lesser sense, that's apostolic. The Winsomeness Project basically says you should only always be operating in one register, basically gentle and reasonable. That's how the Christian always conducts himself in public, in uh, debates, in conversations, in secular settings. You're just known, boiling this down, for being nice. But there's a problem with this. The apostles in Acts 5 rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. They rejoiced that they were suffering, and they didn't stop proclaiming Christ. They kept on proclaiming him. In Acts 12, Paul was reviled and blasphemed and hated for preaching Christ. He did not transgress codes there. He did not do something wrong. The book of Acts is a book about Christians turning the world upside down, Acts 17, by bold, fearless, loving proclamation of the Word and the Gospel. We remember, I think, that if you forget the apostles, 
the Lord of the church bore the fruit of the Spirit perfectly in his life. So if you want to connect dots here, again, not a biblical word, winsome, but Christ was the most winsome person who ever lived, insofar as winsomeness is reflected in Scripture. He was the most righteous, holy, loving person who ever lived and ever will live. And he was crucified. People hated him. They put him on a cross. The point is this. The Winsomeness Project isn't just not a great strategy for the negative world. The Winsomeness Project doesn't reflect biblical Christianity. That's the real issue. We are not witnessing in winsome Christianity, so-called bold, apostolic Christianity, that, yes, bears all the fruit of the Spirit and must do so, and we're all a work in progress, and we all stumble in many ways, James 3, 2, and we all have sin to repent of. And it's true that some of those who are the more outspoken type, the more proclamatory type, do have to watch themselves with regard to gentleness and love. I I see that in myself. I have to watch myself. I have sin to repent of there at the level of mind, thinking, at the level of heart, desiring, at the level of mouth, words, at the level of hands, actions. But that's not just the outspoken types that have sin to repent of. That's every Christian. We're all a work in progress. Again, part of what the Winsomeness Project champions fall prey to is they, they fall into the trap, the wrong trap, of thinking that the bold, outspoken Christians are the ones who are robbing them of what is theirs. They're the ones messing things up. And that means that a lot of so-called winsome Christians, and everybody brace for irony's impact here, end up not liking numerous members of the body of Christ. And Here's a second blow of irony. They end up thus spending a lot of their time scorching fellow Christians for not being winsome like they are. And thus they end up in a place of real pride and despisal. I don't say this with glee or happiness. If you follow an unbiblical path, if you adopt an unbiblical approach, you are always going to end up in a bad place. And the Winsomeness Project, because it is not grounded in Scripture, because it is really trained on getting the favor of unbelievers who are impressive and staying in that favor, ends up causing tremendous division in the church. And the real focus of many winsome Christians practically, then, does not become about being winsome. It actually ends up morphing into being angry at those who are not winsome. So the irony is thick here, thick as truffle fries. We need to understand, fourthly, hastening this little podcast, humble little podcast, to a close, that being winsome is not an end unto itself. Search the Scripture, test my words, test the spirits, including the spirits of Stran, and see if there's a call to be winsome. I'm not trying to bind you to me and my teaching. I'm trying to bind you to the Word, however I can, best I can. Being winsome isn't an end unto itself. Being courageous is really key for the Christian. If you're going to be a bold Christian in this world and be a witness You have to recognize you have the wind in your face, given that this is a fallen order. And you're going to have to, in Christ, praying all the while, depending on the majestic mercy of God, find your courage in God. You're not courageous. I'm not naturally courageous. But God will work in us so that we can be courageous, and thus we can be convictional, and thus we will be a loving presence in the world. Remember that love, in biblical terms, is not defined as unbelievers thinking you are loving. (laughs) No biblical virtue is defined by how unbelievers regard it. Love is defined by God. 
love in the biblical mind is not affirmative of sin. Love is transformative regarding sin. Biblical love is, is not love of affirmation of the self in its sin. Biblical love is love of transformation of the self out of sin. We have to preach the word in being courageous. Think of 2 Timothy 4, 2 and following. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And then what does Paul go on to say? For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will wander, will turn away from listening to the truth, excuse me, and wander off into myths. As for you, Timothy, Paul is saying, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Endure suffering. What's there to suffer about if you're staying in the good graces of leftist influencers? There's a higher call than being liked. There's a higher call than being seen as nice. There's a higher call than being understood as loving according to the secular, unregenerate mind. The call is to glorify God. The call is to tell the truth. The call is to fulfill Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. Telling the truth is loving. Rebuking those who contradict sound doctrine, Titus 1.9, is righteous. This leads us to understand and conclusion. Fifthly, that the Winsomeness Project is Christianity cut off at the knees. It's in truth feminized Christianity. It's a Christianity without men. I didn't say without males. I said without men. Christianity is not about fundamentally being liked, being seen as respectable and thoughtful. We want to be thoughtful. We want to be a positive presence in a community. We are not trying to come into cities and towns and suburbs and be hated as if just being hated is a good thing. We do work on our speech. We do seek self-control. We don't blast people angrily. We're all a work in progress here. We all fail. We all stumble. We all must confess. We all must repent of our sin before a holy God. We're, We're not excusing any and all behavior just because we happen to quote a Bible verse. That is not a right understanding of a response, a just response, just rejection, that is, of the Winsomeness Project. We are trying to be those who live at peace with all men and lead a quiet life, 1 Timothy 2. But we need to just break with the Winsomeness strategy. This doesn't mean that you hate people. It doesn't mean that you set aside the fruits of the Spirit. It does mean this as we conclude. You live out a bold faith. You don't live your life according to the opinion of your peers. You don't measure how well your church is doing by how nicely thoughtful unbelievers, impressive non-Christians in your community talk about you. That's not your litmus test. Frankly, the opinions of unbelievers got nothing to do with it. What you care about is the verdict of God. What you care about is what God thinks about you. What you care about is God's priority. What does Isaiah 66 to tell us that God looks for? Who is the man to whom God looks? Who is the Christian that God is blessed by? Isaiah 66, 2, the one who is humble, contrite, and trembles at my word. There is so little humility, contrition, and trembling at God's word in the broader secular world today, and then even in the church. Do you want to know who many people tremble before? unbelievers. Many professing Christians tremble before the word of men. They're seeking the approval of men. True 
biblical Christianity, molded and shaped by Christ Jesus, trembles only at the Word of God. The Word of God is everything to us. If you're embarrassed by the Word of God and where it takes you, you need to ask yourself whether you are truly born again. I don't say that in heat or anger or hatred. I say that in love. If the Word of God is causing problems for your personal respectability and winsomeness project, you need to ask yourself whether you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and you may not. And the good news is you can be born again. You're not just born again out of a a drugs and alcohol chasing lifestyle. People need to absolutely be eternally rescued from a fear of man lifestyle. From a heart that craves the approval of influential, respectable, and powerful humans. Only one verdict matters. Only one sentence will count on the last day. Well done, good and faithful, sir.